Smart means nothing. Right. Smarts are only one tenth of what you need to succeed. Yeah. Hard work matters and, and, and dedication and like not giving up and tenacity. These things are so much more important to success. I think all business should really come from your own need. So in, in that case, it was more of like a demand for my personal life just to get out of the city. I, I always grew up in the country, so I was a farmer and just wanted to get out. And that's what drove me to kind of get out of the city. And ultimately, it grew from there. More people wanted you know, to stay at our house and then the whole idea sort of developed. I'm really driven by brand, about brand recognition. I've, I think I made this statement 20 years ago in an interview where I said, you know, what matters to me is I will be sitting in a bar and overhear somebody next door to me talking about the company that I created or the product that I created or whatever I think, saying how it influenced their life or changed them in some way or another. And that really motivates me. It's like I want to do something and people go, I can't live without that thing. Yeah. And we were doing that at the resorts and it was fun. and, and but the resorts take like sometimes five years to realize and a huge amount of money. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we've got seven resorts in the pipeline and it's a lot of work doing that, but it doesn't give me enough instant gratification. So the hubs came along and Discovery came along and the sailboat is really just a personal escape to the water. <laughs> it's hardly a business. Yeah. Um, but I think to answer your question, brand, and just being able to do something and you look at it and you say, wow, I, you know, we did that and I really enjoy bricks and mortar, but I'm enjoying technology at the same time. And my wife and I get a kick out of it. Right. So at the moment, we still love it. Mm. Smart means nothing. Right. Smarts are only one tenth of what you need to succeed. Mm. Hard work matters and, and, and dedication and like not giving up and tenacity, these things are so much more important to success, mm. all right? So if you come from a difficult background, so to speak, you inherently already have that. How many second generation and third generation hugely successful families have seen mm. successful children? It right. doesn't happen. Why? Mm. Because I'm just too comfortable. I've always naturally learned from my mistakes because I never listened to anybody. In fact, I still don't listen to everyone. So typically I have to fall down and then figure it out and go, oh, why didn't you tell me? And they go, we did, Grant. And I said, I didn't, you didn't. You know, I, you know, just yeah. an arrogant idiot most of the time. Um, but you know, trying to teach that or mentor that through your company and try and teach people to not fear making a mistake is really, really hard in China. Mm. Uh, people are nervous and I'm a big personality. so. That, when I walk in the room, everyone's a little bit like even more nervous. Um, but what we try and do at Naked is we're trying to push, 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 go make a mistake and then celebrate the mistakes. Because if we can give that feeling to everyone that it's okay to fuck up, yeah. then we will be innovative. We will do cool stuff. If everyone's just terrified of making a mistake, you're really going to go nowhere. So it's it's so much easier spoken like this to tell you that story to make it actually happen in practice is is really hard in china yeah it's just personality wise these guys are not they just uh, greatest example was 2004 when i i, I closed down ebytes uh, which my previous company it was a big company it was i won a big entrepreneur award in south africa i sold some technology i made some money but ultimately i closed the company because i grew too fast and i made a lot of mistakes mm. and i chose to take a year doing an mba after that not to learn anything from an MBA, mm. because the greatest excuse to spend time, you know, introspecting yeah. on what happened. Mm. And I spent the whole year, and I wrote mm. every single thesis or essay or whatever I had to do, always related back to my own experience, my company. So that whole year was looking back and trying to see what did I do right, what did I do wrong. Mm. And then I guess, you know, I now recruit people based on their self-awareness. Um, because people that are typically more self-aware are just so much easier to work with. Mm. You know, I'm shit at a lot of stuff and I'm going to tell you all those things I'm shit at. Yeah. And it's okay because I'm quite good at these things. Right, right, right. And as soon as I hear that, dude, I'll find any job for you somewhere in this company. Uh, but 
th that's another trait that's not very easily yeah. found my, in my, China. One of my finance professors said there's only one thing, there's only one person better that someone's always right, yeah. someone's always wrong. I should tell you that, um, you know, we were able to sell some equity in Naked uh, last year and uh, um, which is the first time we've ever sold equity in our company. It was a small portion, but it gave us enough money to certainly retire for the rest of my life. Yeah. Um, and then we decided to throw everything back in the pot and build out these hubs and, you know, all of our own money. And uh, so, you know, going, throwing it all in again, all the chips back in the table. Mm. I think that's, you've no. just an entrepreneur, that's what he does. Mm. And, uh, I, you know, my mum said, I'll make more money than anybody I'll ever know, mm. but I'll, 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 I'll die broke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Keep trying yeah. Try, right? um, so, you know, it's part of a, a cycle and I'm not afraid of it. I'm not afraid of, of, of that failure, so to speak. Mm. If you have something, you, you should do it. You should try and do it. What, we only live once. Mm. You know, there's not, no afterlife in my you know, humble opinion. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, if, you don't try something and you've been dreaming about it, there's something wrong with you inherently. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people like that. That was something that was really important to us from the beginning was how do we, how do we leave, a, you know, leave an imprint in someone that they might just actually take home and do themselves. Mm -hmm. um, we believe you can't hard sell it. You really just can't you know, push your ideals on other people. And in China, they really don't respond well to any ideals being pushed on them. Yeah, sure. So, but they like to follow and copy. So you're just leaving it there, giving the content, making sure they can read it. We have a museum which showcases how we built stuff. So, but China's going through that learning process. And right. you know, they're the smartest people in the world. I believe that. And they will get through it and then they will innovate and then they'll be better. But are they the smartest or are they just like, they just got the best hustle right now? Like yeah, they'll, they'll work of course, it, right? of course. Like, I mean, you grew up, if you grew up in hardship and difficult times, it drives you harder than anyone else. I came here with a purpose to try and uh, find something to sell to China. Um, I got a job with a consulting firm in South Africa who brought me here. Uh, that was kind of a gig just to allow me to be here and explore what's available in China. And then, uh, I looked at so many products to try and bring to China, but ultimately supply was always a problem. Yep. And then this idea came along and I said, well, maybe this is what I'm bringing. I'm bringing like the African safari or the, the weekend getaway, which is so normal in my country. Okay, um, okay. So, you know, it, it kind of just... So you were already thinking getaway. Right? Yeah, like... getaway was a personal thing, but the first thing, the most important thing was sell to China, sell mm. to China, not buy from China. Everyone. Right. In that year, in those years, everyone was buying China, buying China, you know, you come here, source, buy, sell, export. And we were always the other way. I always wanted to make the Chinese, I wanted to build a brand that was, you know, that China liked. You know, it was both the best thing we did and well as the hardest thing, trying to do everything yourself. I mean, once you've done it yourself once and twice becomes easier, three times become easier, but it's extremely hard to do anything in China, let alone build a resort in the middle of the country. Um, I have many Chinese friends that still can't believe it's real that I'd managed to do that because they say they couldn't, they wouldn't even be able to do it. Uh, and, and, and that's actually more true than anything. A city person would really struggle to go to the countryside and build a resort with the complications of the village people and stuff like that. But, but I'm much more comfortable with the, the farmers and the village peasants than I am with the city people. So it's kind of easier for me, I guess. So, I mean, it's interesting. It you understand the city, or sorry, you understand the country more than a city person would. Like, is that a competitive advantage? Like, as an entrepreneur, oh. like you just you just could see things clear. You're willing to put up the pain more. You you could talk to people different. Like, is that what yeah. makes you unique, or that what made you? Unique I, I think it's what. Yeah, I, I don't know if it makes me any better or worse, but uh, it's it's definitely a massive advantage that came from Africa and uh, in the countryside of Africa. A farmer or you know a laborer on a farm in China is no different from a laborer on a farm in South Africa in fact probably the same for America too um, but you know very few pe people get to interact with that sort of level of person as well as the very rich guy that you're trying to sell a house to or invite to your resort so I, I think the advantage probably I had over you know maybe some first world country people is that I really related to these guys a lot easier mm. And I enjoyed it actually. I enjoyed the evenings in their houses, drinking baijiu, making friends, mm. you know, from the, you know, the 
peasant farmer to the village chief to the party secretary or whatever the case may be all of that is it different from anywhere else i think it is because it's so gray and 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 like uh you know the the amount of time you get told uh may or you know i can't help you or there's no direction for that or i don't know how to do this mm. you're a foreigner you can't do that or you know the, the amount of times you hit a brick wall and nobody knows the answer is mm. it's kind of like you you get numb to it okay. um so over the years you i used to get really stressed to the point that i was like close to have a heart attack in fact i had a heart attack in 2009 a mild wow. mild infarction or whatever they call yeah, it yeah. um and i was you know really stressed everything was on the line you know and it can and that happens for any entrepreneur you have yeah. moments where you, everything's on the line but i think it's a bit like therapy china because if you come out of it you become the most calm dude in the world it's like nothing can faze you you drive down the road and like yeah. someone cuts you off it's like hey dude no worries man just nothing phases yeah. you anymore right. and I, i'm i've kind of reached that phase okay. actually i'll tell you a story just yeah. a funny story this is a side you can maybe cut this later but uh okay. the hardest thing in business in china is is government mm. all right and it's it's uh it takes a huge amount of time and energy and i often ask myself why do i why can't i have bigger guangxi and bigger places that can solve these problems and um because it it's a lot harder for foreign companies yeah. um the the hurdles we get given are are far more complicated than local yeah. companies and uh and that makes it a, quite difficult <coughs> to compete sure. I, i think there's a, a huge number of examples in yahoo and google and facebook and i yeah. could go on and name all their failures and it's largely because of the hurdles and it's difficult yeah. and yes china wants chinese homebred companies to succeed that's why we are not a foreign company we yeah. we are a wholly owned foreign company but the yeah. government knows us as law shing and the brand the chinese brand is far more important yeah. but still it's, it's it, it is the thing that i if only i could not have to have all those hurdles right Th- there's two types of companies there's the the quiet company that's sort of operates and makes profits and uh it doesn't uh like in the limelight it's like in the background yeah and then there's the company like naked which is trying to be a brand and that can also have two types you can be really big company where you're powerful and you can be a middle sized company and then you the, the kind of small company and a lot of people want to sort of operate in the in the shadows because it's a lot easier you get less mm. trouble right. but as soon as you're in the limelight it's uh there's a bigger target to to shoot at yeah and You know, sometimes I think that the whole world's against me here. You know, the government's against me and why is somebody complaining about this and, you know, fire bureaus give me this trouble for what reason? Who's making the trouble for me? And yes, I've had many thoughts of conspiracy theories about, you know, I'm is the naked getting too big now and the party secretary was just outside the Shanghai party secretary yeah. standing outside our door talking with a whole crowd of people. And like my staff are taking photos out the window and I'm going like, "Oh, shit." I don't want the party secretary of Shanghai talking outside my door. Yeah. That can't be good. Right, right. And that's not a good feeling to have, is it? Right. I mean, we should be like, "Yay, cool man. This is like We're he's being noticed. He might say something in his next speech and I'm going like, "No, no more attention." Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you know, yeah. who's going to knock on my door tomorrow? And but that's China. I don't think it's a conspiracy. I just I do think that Chinese companies too like to stay out of the limelight. Yeah. And it's difficult. That's why we're in the opposite trend. We're trying to make a brand, which is a new thing to China. Mm-hmm. How many brands do you China brands do you know? Right. There's so few. Especially foreign built. Yeah, right. well, those and, are very and, few. And not a global brand coming in, but a, a domestic brand yeah, that's yeah. right. Right? Those are few. When you an entrepreneur, you have an outcome in mind, and that's kind of what you you you're driving towards. And if building a relationship is going to help me get to the outcome, then that's the purpose of the relationship first and foremost. However, along the way you do meet some amazingly cool nice people. Mm. And I've made some real true friends. They know not a lot. Uh but, you know, who's to say more than 5 is a is is a big number or a little right. number or whatever the case may be, but I've made a few very very good friends in the process. In mm. fact, people that I count as my best friends in the world. Right. Uh they were supportive either from government side or private side. Um but that would be the same anywhere, I guess, in the world. Uh yeah. but the process of building those relations to get the outcome that's a non-negotiable in china if you don't do that you will fail yeah. not because 
it's like you need a friend to, to you know, you need to bribe someone or something. It's not that. It's that there are insurmountable problems every single day in a project that you, no one knows the solution. And if you don't have someone who's trying to help you, genuinely trying to help you, right. you'll fail. Yeah. Simple as that. At Naked, we do everything ourselves. Sure. Um, and, and it's because there's a problem giving business out in China. It's still, mm. still very unreliable. Sure. And, uh, and you'll get, you'll get, more failure than you'll get success. Right. So we have a huge design studio with 35 people. Mm. We have an IT department, so software coding, 30 something people. Mm. We have project management, finance, HR, every single function in the company, even down to construction, we have some people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we do everything ourselves. However, now this is the trick. Naked Hub, the whole idea of this business is to try to change that. Yeah. And to say that by creating many companies under one roof, mm. literally under a physical roof, yeah. you create a trust. Yeah. So I don't want to have an HR department. I'm going to outsource to that little HR company down the corridor. Mm. Because if he doesn't do his job, I'm going to walk down there and pull his ear. Yeah. Which we can't do in China. And the, the trust of service business amongst mm. China is so weak that typically we don't outsource as much as we should. Right, right. And I think that Hub and the whole co co-working office will be 50,000 square meters at the end of this year. Wow. That will be 9,000 members. That's probably something like, uh, you know, 500 companies. Yeah. Uh, you, you will find any company you need yeah. under that roof. Yeah. Then you start to create companies with much smaller, you know, people, mm -hmm. much lower HR requirements and stuff like it. Just outsource. Yeah. And only if it's under one roof where you yeah. can create a little bit of greater trust. You know, I, I think that 50% of the foreigners here are, are running away from something somewhere else, and that's mm. why they're here. Yeah. And there's another 50% that are half decent. But mm. I don't think that the sample of foreigners here is equivalent of a sample of foreigners in London or New York or mm. another city like that. So I, I've had a lot of failure with mm. foreigners. Is uh, it a hunger thing? Is it a skills gap? Is it just like a fuck you, I'm foreign and therefore I'm better than the Chinese? Like, is it, yeah. or they're just an unwillingness to generally What's all of those like? things, you know, that whole, you know, I'm better than Chinese thing, that, that really bothers me because I say, mm. I'm sorry, mate, you're not. My stars in this company are not foreigners. Mm. They're Chinese. Mm. The people that have done the most for this company, the most valuable this company are Chinese people. Mm. And, and, and if you don't create a company driven by Chinese people in China, then you, there's something wrong with your brain. Mm. You really need to realize that they're able and competent and able to do so much more mm. than the foreigner. But a foreigner with good self-awareness can do well here. But too many of them don't have that. Too many of them come with the, fuck you, I know what I'm doing and you should just listen to me because I'm, you know, I'm a foreigner. Yeah. And I know. And they don't. They, right. Typically, they actually here because they're not that clever in the first place. You know, the, the company needs to have a certain sort of formality to it. Mm. Um, and I do everything I can to stop that. Okay. Um, I hate it. It breaks creativity. Mm. This whole hub business yeah. has been the best thing I've ever done because it's broken up our company into like, beer is okay to drink at 9 a.m. in the morning. Mm. And I encourage everyone to drink. <laughs> and I say, it's okay to be drunk and do yeah. some work. If it's going to influence your work, then you should think about it. Make an adult decision. Right. If you're a creative person and it's going to help your work, go wild. Get a hammer. I don't yeah. care. Right. You're an adult. But we're breaking up and people are sitting around us. We don't know who they are. They other companies and we make friends. Mm. Girls and boys are meeting each other and having fun things and stuff like that. And, and, and that inform inf informality, in a way, yeah. is spurring creativity, innovation, pushing us to do cooler new things. Mm. That's what I'm in business for. Right, so, right. yeah, I mean, we might be bigger and like all structured and there's an HR department, there's a marketing department, there's a branding department, there's all the departments mm. and they all have a VP of something and right. everyone has some kind of role. But uh, I, I spend most of my job trying to break all that stuff down. Okay. So, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, the first question about being, you know, like on your own lonely, it is, yeah. it is kind of lonely at times. Mm. Most of the people we know work in multinationals and have no advice to offer anyone like me. Um, right. <clears throat> but we never looked at a hospitality business. Uh, when we built Naked Home, Naked Stables, the first two resorts, 
we still never had anyone work for us who had worked even in a mm. hospitality company. Yeah. So uh, when we were fitting out the rooms and designing it, it was purely how we thought it should be. Mm. And I think that was our biggest advantage is we came with a completely clean slate. And now that's the same in every one of our businesses. I mean, Naked Discovery, there's nothing in, 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 there's nothing in China even close to what we're trying to do at Naked Discovery. Yes, the hub business, there's a similar WeWork company, yeah. but we still go about it our own individual approach. Yeah, um, sure. You know, there's not ever WeWork in Shanghai yet mm. to copy, so to speak. Right. Uh, so we, we kind of do everything with our own blank piece of paper. And I think that's inherently what an entrepreneur is anyway. I mean, most entrepreneurs anyway like to design their own logic and thinking to it. You know, some days you have a little bit of doubt and question whether you're doing the right thing. Some days you think, oh, is there a problem with China? But then you look at the fundamentals and you, and you realize that this is only going one place, certainly for the next decade. Yeah. Uh, the fundamentals in this country are sound. Um, the people are hungry. And if you're in tourism and co-working spaces, you're on the right end of the curve. You know, you can't be doing bad stuff. It's good for the world. It's, you know, everything's right. So hopefully when you tick all those kind of boxes, then hopefully the government sort of realizes that you're good. Yeah. And that gives you the, the gap, so to speak. And we've done everything off our own skin. We had some early investors a long, long time ago mm. with Naked Home, but after that it was just my wife and I for, okay. for many years. Um, but how do I celebrate? I think the more I, the, the more successful Naked becomes is giving me more freedom to spend doing the things that I've always dreamed of doing, which is typically on the water sailing right, and right, right. with my kids to teach them to play the sports that I want to yeah. play. As a company, we, we celebrate all the time. I think every day is a party mm. and uh, there's a lot of uh, you know, uh, the idea amongst us is we shouldn't like, you know, have too many milestone targets. We should just celebrate the, the journey as a, as, a, as, a, as a bit of fun along the way. And if we're having fun, we won't even realize when we reach the goal. Yeah. But in our business, you know, often when the building is open or the resort is opening or the hub is opening, it's, yeah. you know, you see that milestone. It's so visible in front of you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we typically always have a party though. Okay. Uh, yeah, it involves, you know, getting drunk and misbehaving.